Okay, so welcome to episode three of The Graph Show. Uh, just to recap briefly uh, before I introduce our um, uh, uh, Ryan, who's going to talk to us about graphs and category theory. Um, in episode one of The Graph Show, I talked to Jans Osman about RDF and property graphs, the two uh, predominant families of graph data models, RDF being the W3C standard graph data model, which has a formal specification, um, a, a well-designed formal specification, which uh, makes it very appropriate for data integration. Um, on the other hand, you have property graphs, which are more of an informal uh, graph data model, but which many developers find to be uh, very intuitive. And I, in episode two, I talked with uh, Denise Gosnell about what she calls graph thinking and the way that uh, property graphs uh, lend themselves to naturally expressing um, your domain of interest as a graph and accessing uh, uh, data uh, from the graph in a natural way. Um, so, uh, of course, um, you might wonder whether these you can have the best of both worlds, um, sort of the formality of RDF and the intuitiveness of property graphs. Um, and there's been uh, plenty of work in that area. Uh, Possibly in um, another episode, we'll talk more about RDF star or the GQL uh, effort. Uh, but one uh, very promising approach, in my opinion, um, is category theory. And that's um, what I've personally worked with Ryan on. Um, category theory has uh, is somehow graph-like. It has close connections to graph theory uh, and also to database theory, uh, type theory, logics, uh, and so on. So I'll, I'll just uh, hand it over to Ryan. Um, he's very organized and actually has slides prepared um, to tell you more about uh, category theory. All right. Thanks, Josh. And yeah, hopefully we can keep this more in the interview style. But um, yeah, there are slides simply because um, you know, with category theory, we're starting to get into that level of complexity where things need to be written down or it, it's hard to know uh, what you're talking about. But um, that being said, the connection between graphs and categories is actually very direct. Um, one way to think of categories is as graphs with extra structure, uh, which is what um, these slides are showing. So I figure we can walk through these and then uh, pause for questions and then uh, go from there. So how does that sound? That sounds good. So I think we can assume most of the audience is familiar with graphs, you know, what are vertices, what are edges. Um, so that analogy of vertices and edges with objects and morphisms in category theory might be a good place to start. Great. Okay. So, right. What is a category? So we think of a category as consisting of objects. We're going to write these as A, B, and C, and so forth on the slides, and arrows, which we call morphisms. We'll write these in lowercase. Um, these artifacts correspond very directly to the nodes, the vertices, and the edges uh, in a graph. In fact, you can think of them interchangeably if you're suitably careful. And so uh, to elaborate on that, for every arrow F, we say that it has a source and a target. Um, the source and the target will be objects in the category. There's always uh, one, so it's like saying every edge in a graph has a source and a target. And here, of course, by graph we mean uh, directed multigraph. That's kind of the implicit um, implicit in category theory when you say graph. It's a directed multigraph. So right, directed edges, uh, source and targets, and uh, we write that with a little arrow. And so you know, in a graph, you might say, okay, we have an edge from S to T, and the edge is called F. You know, in category theory, you say, oh, I have an arrow or a morphism from object S to object T, but it's it's written the same way. So. So far, a category just has the, it's the same thing as a graph. And here below, we're going to add some more stuff. But um, clear so far? Uh, clear to me, hopefully clear to the audience. So what's different about a category um, as opposed to a graph? What else right. do you need? So that's all this extra stuff down here. So uh, the first thing you get you need is a composition relation. And so this tells you how to compose the edges in your graph if you're thinking of it that way. Although later we'll think of um, composing paths through a graph. Uh, but that's the, the extra bit of structure number one. So if you have uh, an arrow going from A to B like this and an arrow going from B to G like this, then the additional structure of a category theory over your graph gives you this combined edge. It says there must be an edge from A to C. Uh, we're going to write that as uh, G following F. 
Uh, sometimes you see F semicolon G, but that's extra bit of structure number one. A composition relation uh, written is a circle that takes arrows that align tip to tail. So you have to have, you know, the, the target of F has to be the same as the source of G, but when that's the case, you can compose them. And then this composition operation has to be associative. And so that's written as an equation here. But that's and, uh, In practical terms, so what does that do for you? Um, the, the fact that uh, you have to be able to compose any two arrows to, to form um, uh, another arrow. Uh, so the, the way I like to think of this, and this is really more of an intuition, is that um, really it's the composition relation that's of interest in a category. So the edges and the arrows are almost there more um, as bookkeeping. And so, um, you know, you might think of this as function composition, in which case this is telling you how to compose functions f and g. Uh, you might think of this as um, you know, multiply matrices where a and b are, are um, uh, I'll have to work out the analogy a bit more, but basically the, the idea is that it, the semantics of the category is going to be in this composition relation, not so much in the objects uh, and the arrows because all the constructions that we have in category theory are going to preserve this composition relation. And so think of this as giving like the extra meaning that you want to put on top of your graph, uh, if you will. Is that a helpful answer to your question? And there's a lot um, of yeah, things. Yeah, I think that'll be helpful. Uh, maybe the same question for associativity as well. Why would you um, want that guarantee that uh, composition is always associative? Gotcha. So there, you know, it's possible to imagine reasons why you wouldn't want this to hold. Uh, but really, the intuition has to do with uh, treating these as exemplars of functions. So in your, in your mind, you can always think, oh, I have a function from A to B and a function from B to C. And that's kind of motivating these definitions, right? We're, there are a lot more things than functions that are going to form categories, but functions are kind of the, the intuition. And so those are associative, right? If you um, apply uh, functions in this order, or the order doesn't, uh, the associative order when you apply functions doesn't matter, right? If you have, if you apply f to x and then g to the result and then h to the result of that, uh, it shouldn't matter the order in which, uh, you know, if you apply f first and then, right, like, so it's, it's coming down to function composition, I, I guess, is the, the answer to your question, that um, because categories are meant to axiomatize functions and functions are associative, we add the associativity um, in is what categories require. There's things called allegories, uh, which axiomatize relations that have a similar compositionality, but uh, other different axioms, because they're, they're trying to, to be based on, a, on relations rather than functions. Anyway, is that, uh, that a helpful answer? Sure, yeah, another example which might uh, kind of make sense to, to graph folks is, um, you know, if you have two edges, um, uh, two labeled edges, say, uh, you know, uh, mother and father, um, you know, F is uh, father and G is mother. Um, you're always guaranteed that you can have, um, you can define uh, an edge that, which composes the two. So this would be like a uh, you know, grandmother. Um, that's a simple example, but something that, uh, that kind of stand out to. And later, of course, we'll see um, paths as being an example um, of categories that um, uh, but anyway, maybe we should move on to the, the extra bit here, which is the, the identity arrow. So in addition to having this extra structure of a composition relation, which must be uh, associative, uh, there's an additional requirement to have a category, which is that for every A, for every object A, you have to have an identity arrow on it. So we write this as a little self-loop and call it id for identity. Um, but basically, that, that is supposed to function as the unit for um, composition. So it's supposed to cancel and go away. So if you have an arrow F and you compose with the identity, that's the same as just the arrow F. Similarly, if you compose with the identity uh, on the other side. So um, that's it. A category uh, directly labeled multigraph. Uh, then you've got this composition relation that has to be associative and this identity set of identities that has to be uh, the unit for composition. Sure, we have a question here from Nathan. Um, so please give an example of where association fails and how that uh, might be beneficial or insightful. 
So, you know, there are plenty of structures that aren't categories. Like you can look at, uh, take a magma from abstract algebra. That'll give you something that looks like a category but doesn't have associativity. Um, if you try to build a category where you take F and G to be like certain kinds of, um, I was going to say subtraction, would that work? Um, yeah, I mean, examples of things that are not categories. Uh, boy. All right, yeah, I didn't really come equipped to answer questions about what aren't, because in general, like, almost everything is, and so um, that's why mathematicians study categories as opposed to other classes of objects. So, yeah, unless there's an example having to do with, like, how subtraction or something, or division or some arithmetic operation when you try to build that into a category fails. Like, I don't have any examples of uh, things that are category-like except for the failure of this particular axiom. Could you maybe give um, some, some high-level context on, you know, what I mentioned at the beginning, the connection between category theory and, and other mathematical disciplines and how category theory can be used as kind of a, uh, 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 to bridge the gaps between those disciplines? Sure. So as you're kind of seeing with these definitions, um, the reason mathematicians study categories is that so many structures follow this pattern. So, for example, um, take... Uh, we could take take uh, the natural numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, um, and we can say, okay, there's going to be an edge from one natural number to another if the, the source is greater than the target. And so your edges are just, you have one if, you know, the source is greater than the target, and, you know, you can build a category that way. Um, essentially, anything you can, almost anything you can study mathematically can be arranged into the things you're interested in, the objects, the ways those things relate to each other, the morphisms, and then that's almost always associative. So there's an entire branch of math, category theory, that uh, looks at other domains of math, say group theory, ring theory, what have you, and axiomatizes them in terms of categories and then studies the results. And so um, really what you get that from that is the ability to, to relate the different branches of math to each other. So you can relate a category in topology to a category in algebra uh, and then use that, the connection between them, to take results from one field to another. So uh, things like, you know, this this um, surface doesn't have a, in a self-loop can turn into like the roots of an equation are uh, real rather than imaginary types of transport. So uh, yeah, this uh, category theory itself was invented post-World War II to relate uh, different branches of math together and this these categories here appear to be really the underlying abstraction. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's really worth pointing out um, that, that category theory has that property of, of being able to, to create those connections. Um, so um, uh, go on. What do you have on, on your next slide? Okay. So, you know, even though this is the definition of a category in the abstract, um, what I'd like to talk about now is uh, a different way to present the idea of a category that is even closer to what graph theorists uh, might appreciate. So here we talk about, uh, you know, here's a composition relation and an identity. What I'd like to talk about now is how you can generate a category from a directed labeled graph along with a set of equivalences between the path. So I'd like to talk about how you can go from a drawing like this uh, into a category like this and then discuss the good things that happen uh, when you do that. So how does that sound like? Uh, okay. So what we're sh what I'm showing here is it's called a category presentation. Um, it it presents Let me interrupt a just for a moment. Sorry. So we got another question. So it's basically objects and operations and in category theory, the focus is on operations. Is that correct? Uh, I mean, I'm not sure. Like, that's a very general statement. You know, a category is defined to have two classes of things, objects and arrows. Um, I'd say it's really category theory is the study of this composition relation here, right? Like, once you've defined your things and the, the maps between them, you want to what category theory is studying is other operations that preserve the way that yours compose. So it's, um, you know, people often say that category theory is about, you know, how things relate to each other rather than what they are. And I, I guess, you know, you can kind of see that here that um, 
it, 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 you know, the objects here, they just sort of serve as endpoints. It's really about the arrows um, and then about this composition thing. So is that a, a helpful answer to your question? Yeah, I, I think that will be. Um, and one more question the audience is uh, really interested in these, these category theory basics. Um, so the meta notation for category theory is graph-like. Are there any insights that category theory provides to graph theory when we consider the objects to be graphs um, and the morphisms to be something else? Oh, sure. Else? So you can, it will get into this, but basically the objects are graphs and the arrows are graph morphisms, which are maps of nodes to nodes as ed edges to paths, for example. You can, or the, you, you know, category theory has something to say about group theory, where the, the objects are groups and the arrows are group homomorphisms. So, you know, the, the basic answer to your question is that category theory lets us relate, you know, say, uh, these three graphs here to this one in the lower right. That, yeah, there's a, a people use category theory to study what's called the category of graphs um, on a fairly regular basis. And you, you get theorems that say, oh, any, any three graphs arranged in this pattern can be merged, for example, and, and stuff like that. So, uh, yep, you use category theory to study graphs uh, in a variety of different ones. So, you know, there's category of directed labeled multigraphs. There's a category of reflective reflexive graphs. There's a category of undirected graphs. There's, uh, yeah, pretty much anything that can be arranged into a Yeah, and the ability to merge graphs, by the way, is a really useful thing. That's, like I say, something that RDF is quite strong on and which property graphs historically have not been very strong on. All right, thanks for the, uh, sorry for the interruption. Please continue. Oh, my pleasure. So, um, right, this is, uh, we call these presentations of categories because you'll notice here, there's no composition relation written down. There's no identities marked. So what this means to present a category is that we're going to build a category out of sets of paths through this graph. So the objects in the category will be the nodes, but then the morphisms aren't the edges, but the paths. So, uh, for example, the set of morphisms from employee to itself there'll be infinitely many. You'll have um, the zero length path that goes nowhere on employee, the one length path, just the manager, then the manager followed by the manager. And that's a path of length two. Then the manager followed by manager followed by manager, path of length three. And so basically we get a special kind of category, a category of paths uh, from a graph with a set of equations here. And so um, this part here is really what uh, separates a presentation of a category from just the graph up here. And so what you do is you, you take all the paths like I just described through the graph, but then you you equate those paths that uh, are equal according to these equations. So, you know, in the category that you get out of this, you merge, for example, this path with this path. You say, okay, these paths are now the same. You're, you're building a, that's called a, a quotient mathematically that you are taking uh, the path through the graph and taking into account these types of equivalences. And so what you'll end up with when you do this is a category of paths that represent all the ways you can traverse this graph uniquely, where like the fact that if you follow uh, manager followed by works, you always end up at the same play as works. That means that you'll have a path in here, this one, but you won't have this one because it, it's redundant, right? So it's anyway. Um, that's the, the way in which these graphs generate categories. The details are probably not too important and you can find them in a, in a book. But what I'd really like to get to is how these correspond to databases, but, um, I'll, or database schemas. But let me pause there to see if there's, there's questions on. And those equalities, you can think of those as, um, as integrity constraints, right? Correct. So you might ask, you know, what is the point of having categories like this? And so, you know, on the one hand, you can just say, okay, I have a category of paths, it's cool, and it just sits there. But really what we want to do is use categories as database schemas, uh, which is, it connects us, you know, our whole uh, thing that we're doing. And so if you think of this as a schema, then the path equations are data integrity constraints. And it's really the category that this presents that's, that's actually the schema. So you might imagine, for example, you know, a different graph with a different set of equations that still um, is isomorphic to this one. And then, you know, from the category theory point of view, those would, would be like the same, you know, they denote the same categories. You could work with them interchangeably. But 
anyway, yes, that's the intention that when category presentations, um, that our category presentations are going to be used as database schemas. And in particular, there's a, a concept called a functor that is like a function, but it's on top of an entire one of these. It's not, you know, function is, operates on a set, whereas a functor operates on a category. So it's um, a database on this schema is something called a functor. And uh, yeah, it's displayed with the tables below. So let me pause there. That was uh, kind of yeah, a Yeah, a functor but... is based, you can think of a functor, right, as uh, kind of a higher level uh, morphism where the objects are categories and then your arrows between the categories, uh, those are the functors, right? Right. So from the point of view here, you know, it's tempting to say, you know, a, a functor is uh, a function from objects to objects and arrows to arrows that preserves composition and identities. Um, but I think what I'd like to do instead is just write one down. And so people can see how uh, you can use a category as a database schema without necessarily having to understand the concept of functor. And just one more comment. Um, so that, uh, that presentation um, is uh, what you call the free category, right? And every graph has one. For every graph, there's an associated free category. Right. So this part up here, if you just take the, you know, all the paths through the graph, that's the, it's called the free category. And then you take the quotient by this part here, it's like dividing, you know, you divide out the fact that works in is equal to manager followed by works in, and you get another category. And then uh, that's the one that uh, all the functors out of that resulting category will be all the databases that satisfy the constraints. So yeah, kind of a two step process. There's a free category associated with each graph. And so that gives category theory like an immediate, uh, you know, you have a graph, you have a category. And then, uh, but you additionally get out this ability to, um, yeah, take these equ these equations into account. And um, yeah, does that answer your question about free categories? Okay, yeah. So what is a, a what's called a set valued functor? So it's like, uh, you know, a lot of times people will think of graphs as data, but we're thinking of graphs as schema. And so uh, what is a, a, a database instance on this look like? Well, you have a, a set of employees. So for each node, you get a set. And for each edge, you get a function. That's what it means to be a set valued functor. Uh, you get uh, one set for each node and one function for each edge, you know, between the, the sets that, that are given. So here's a set, a of, set employees, of employees, a set of departments, a set of strings. Yep. Yeah. yep. And so here we have three employees, 101, 102, 103. And for example, we have uh, 101 managing 103 and 103 manages himself and so does 102. So it's kind of an unusual organization, uh, very non-hierarchical, but uh, that satisfies the data integrity. So it's allowed. Um, similarly, we can check that you know, every manager really does work in the same department uh, that, that they, that every, every manager really manages the same department they work in. We can check that that holds in this graph as well. But anyway, you know, the real thing to notice here is that um, we have a series of functions, right? First, it's a function from the IDs of employee into strings. And so really all we're saying is we have a set of functions. The nodes in this graph are going to be the sorts, the types. Um, each edge corresponds to a function, and they have to obey these equations down here. So this is also a... a this whole thing together is a structure known as an algebra, uh, which is why you know, you know, we, we talk about algebraic property graphs or algebraic databases or, or what have you. So um, anyway, I'll pause there. Questions on the, like the data aspect of using a category as a schema? Um, I don't see any questions from the audience, but I just wanted to make the point. At, at, at this point, we're not making any kind of a distinction between vertices, um, in a graph and say property values they're they're both part of the the same category right that, that Correct. set of strings has equal status with the set of employees right now that uh you know to implement this stuff on a computer you know you have to be cognizant of the fact that there's infinitely many strings and so you can't like store them in a table for example the way you can your two departments um and so there is you know part of the work we do at connexus and as academics as well and other people help is like figuring out you know, the computational realization of this where, you know, string is distinguished from employee because one is an infinite type and one is a finite database. So uh, 
Um, there are so there is some nuance in, in such here in the, in the software that implements all this, but for the purpose of the talk, you can think of these as all being on equal standing. There's manager, abbreviated, and here's secretary. Yeah. Sure. Other questions? I don't see any other questions. Cool. Okay. Oh, here's one, or a, a few actually, in the group chat. End-to-end uh, -end relations. So uh, how do you model relations using functions? Um, usually you, you use a construction called a, a span. So um, we can do this one. So a um, secretary and name here form a relation uh, with the first component being an employee and the second being a string where you have one entry in your relation per department. So it's like two functions out of the same node. That lets you model a relation actually lets you something model something a little more general, a relation that can have repeated entries, so like a bag relation or like the SQL style relation. But yeah, to, to model relations in terms of functions, you use pairs of these arrows out of a common source. It's called a span. Let me read out another question. Why is a property graph weak on being able to express categories? Is it because property graphs have fewer constraints? So I'm not sure what weak means. I think you know, all I want to emphasize for this talk is that um, graphs and categories are different things. And so to present a category, you need both a graph and a set of path equalities. Um, you know, does that make property graphs weaker or stronger? I'm not really sure. It just means the definition of category contains the definition of graph. You know, later in the slides, we'll talk about our work on algebraic property graphs, which, um, you know, they they look maybe more like uh, what people were having in mind, and we're going to use the same category theory to, to describe them. But um, yeah, it's uh, categories and graphs are just different things. Maybe that's the the way to say it. And um, yeah, the thing that makes categories special are these these equivalences above and beyond what a graph can say. Is that a helpful yeah, so, response? So, yeah, to every graph, including every property graph, there is a category, but. Uh, the reverse isn't necessarily true. I mean, I think we've right. talked about this before. There, there, there is a, a sense in which every category is a graph, but um, uh, right, multiple categories we'll will talk about. Yeah. So, in particular, you can take, you know, you can take this. So we, you know, you can take the free category here and find the graph for it. That's going to be the same graph as if you take this whole thing and find the graph for it. So. Yeah, if you if you think of graphs as just being what you forget from a category when you uh, throw away this composition relation, really the the difference is that you know for each choice of graph in category theory, you you can you get a whole bunch of different choices of edge relation that there there just are, are more categories than there are graphs in that sense. If that if that's helpful, um, I think so. Yeah, I don't think we want to delve into you know large versus small categories and all that. Ah, oh, okay. And someone's asking property graph versus RDF, which uh, we'll get into. And maybe that's actually a good transition point. So because yeah, I know as people to... are, yeah, people are noticing these look like triples and, and that kind of thing. So uh, yeah, I'm ready to move on. Um, if, yeah, if you'll you probably say something about the growth and deconstruction. Yes. So that's uh, that's where this is going. Yeah. Right. So yeah, thing to notice number one or among uh, things to notice is that, you know, given data that looks like this, it's functional. Every, everything's a function out of the IDs into, you know, some other node. And so uh, there's a construction in category theory invented by uh, Grothendieck that lets you turn this tabular data into literally a graph. And so, you know, th this does depend on the schema. So like these edge relations depend on the fact that we have, you know, works in appearing up here. So it's, you know, implicitly there's a, a schema off to the side. But anyway, what category theory lets us do, and, you know, according to the fact that we, we decided to use functions rather than relations, is actually encode these tables as a, a graph that looks like this. And in particular, you have one node per entry in your graph, and then you have one edge per you know, column header when you when you have a, a corresponding entry in the table. And so uh, here is what 
uh, here, here's part, we didn't do all the strings, but you know, here is part of the graph that you get when you take this data and represent it um, as, a, as a graph. Is this clear? Uh, clear to me, unless there are no other questions from the audience. Uh, yeah, please continue. Okay, cool. So, yeah, this is indeed the connection to RDF, which are, you know, I, I think of RDF as triples, but, you know, as you can see here, you know, you have subject, predicate, object type of things are possible. And so um, we can uh, get into that now. Uh, I guess one thing I, I wanted to mention, though, like, you know, before, or wh why would you want to do this before getting into, like, how, how can you, which is that, you know, th there's things that are easier to write this way in category theory. And so a large part of what we're doing with the software corresponding to this is uh, building out such niceties. So for example, um, we have a series of tables here, and so you, you can do relational algebra to them, you can query them, what have you. And if you write SQL code, you, you do things like from the employee table twice, join them together, and et cetera, et cetera. There is more natural syntax suggested by category theory that exploits the actual structure of the graph up here to be able to say, oh, just follow the manager foreign key, just follow the works in name. And so, you know, there are things that category theory has to say about, you know, how to put this formalism to work. And it's really these that are the value proposition of this formalism. You know, the fact that we can represent property graphs in it is cool, but it's hopefully things more like this that are actually useful to, to working programmers. So. Anyway, that's yeah part of the motivation is that you get better ways to, to manipulate things in this categorical approach. Um, and so, yeah, I guess just as a further example, when you do run a query like this, uh, one of the things the math tells you is that queries can be run in two different directions. So it's not like you can invert necessarily every query that you write, but you will be able to round trip every query that you write, like run it once and then run it back and then compare where you land. Uh, this is a property that you only get when you use category theory. Can you explain sort of that distinction out. a little bit between being able to reverse a query and being able to round trip it? Sure. And so here I, I regret not uh, bringing the other slides in, but the basic idea is that you can take, um, and this slide is actually a poor example because here we, we do have an inverse thing going on. But the, the basic idea is that for any query you write in this categorical formalism, uh, say you write something like this. You know, I have a, a query from this schema to this other schema. For any one that you write, uh, you can evaluate it and it looks like SQL does. You know, it, it products things together, does filtering, et cetera, et cetera. But you can also go back, meaning that you can run the query in a reverse direction, which does things like invent fresh values. It uh, merges elements rather than join them. It has a, a dual semantics. And so what you find, what the math tells you, is that you can take a query, you can run it, and then you can run it backwards. And you won't get back to the same place you start. You know, you can't inverse the fact that you like projected and threw away information. But you can, for example, freely add new information and so you can come up with a relationship between where you started and the round trip, you know, where you went and then how you came back. And so the categorical formalism has these very strong round tripping properties um, and they go by the name of adjoints. So the people who study category theory may have heard that word, but what you're seeing here is an adjunction that's called between query evaluation and query co-evaluation. And yeah, what that gives you is not the ability to invert queries, that's impossible, but the ability to round trip them and talk about, you know, how the query, uh, what it did, like in terms of, of where you started. So that's a bit of a, a hand wavy explanation, but um, hopefully it can pique people's interest in the, in the subject. Yeah, and the reason that, that it's not always possible to invert the query is that it, the uh, mapping may be lossy, right? right? So you're selecting from a big graph and you're only selecting certain things into a result. Um, you can't necessarily round trip that. Right. Maybe we can, maybe we can give some additional examples of uh, categorical queries. Like, what could these two? What else could these two boxes be, and what could that queue be? Uh, for example, uh, you're using Sparkle to query over a, a property graph, or uh -huh. you're migrating um, data that's expressed in one schema to uh, data that's expressed in a different schema. 
And any other examples that kind of spring to mind? Oh boy, there's so many. So right. um, the inheritance problem and in object-oriented programming it shows up in here when you have like a diamond where the co-evaluation of your query gives you like the minimal merge you would need to restore like everything having one, exactly one parent. Um, you know, in many cases, this is just, you know, this is a bank, this is a different bank, communicate financial data. You know, we see a lot of that. Um, sometimes this is, we've seen things like this is one version of an airplane's avionics package. Uh, this is another. And there the relationship between, and this queue is like an update. And so people are interested in, you know, specifying this update declaratively so that, you know, different software processes can be automated using it, like the, the automation of applying the update and stuff like that. Um, you know, so version control is one we've seen. Um, we see scientists needing to do this all the time. You know, this is my experimental data, uh, but somebody else, you know, I, I'm a physicist, and but a, a chemist needs my data, and so they're set up one way, and, you know, my gigabytes worth of experiments are set up a different way. Got to migrate it there. So there's um, yeah, it, most ETL types of tasks can be formalized this way. Um, but yeah, really, the, the sky's the limit. There's actually a, a lemma that says you can do, you know, relational algebra this way. And so it's a very expansive class of computations. Yeah, and it's a, it's a class of problems that you see constantly in, in enterprise setting. I mean, you just gave some examples, but like any time you have... Uh, you need to bring two schemas together that weren't designed um, as a unit. You need some kind of mapping. And in fact, it's funny you should mention that. Uh, here's an example that makes use of multiple schemas and mappings. And so uh, this one comes from health records. And the idea here, we, we mentioned it briefly, but now is really the time to talk about it, that category theory here gives you guidance. You know, if, if you give it schemas that you want integrated, so this one on the lower left and this one on the upper right, and you give it a schema that characterizes the overlap along with mappings between it. And so these mappings can be these queries like we showed up here, or there's other ways. They can be functors directly. There's a number of ways to make this connection. But the, the point is that when you do that, you get the math tells you, you know, here's how you should actually merge uh, your schemas. And then the story repeats at the level of data. But um, yeah, so these, these primitive building blocks, the queries, not only are they useful directly, but they're useful to specify how other things are connected so that you can, you can integrate them. And so here's an example where, where there's multiple mappings. Um, anyway, was that helpful? I think so. Um, uh, what do you have next? Are we getting to uh, property graphs? I think so. So having uh, you know, described uh, what categories are and how data on them looks, and the cool stuff you can do to get into graphs and like writing SQL looking code and round tripping them uh, and integrating them. So there's, you know, you can integrate schemas and you can integrate the data on those schemas in a nice way. Um, yeah, the idea now is to turn towards how you use category theory to uh, define and operate on property graphs, uh, the joint work uh, with you. And so that is indeed uh, the, next, uh, the next thing to move on to. Although maybe before we do, we can pause here uh, for questions. Are there any questions on the first half of the talk before we move into more uh, what Josh and I have been up to? Why don't you just continue? I'll, I'll interrupt you if I have to, if uh, questions show up in the chat. Okay, cool. Right. So this next section of the talk is about work that Josh and I have been doing together uh, for a while now. And so this is all contained in um, you know, our joint paper. You can find it on the archive. But um, the basic idea is to come up with uh, or to formalize uh, what is going on at Uber that they're doing internally to sort of standardize their own schemas. So um, the idea here is to apply categorical methods uh, like we just saw to help with that problem. And when you do that, uh, you arrive at um, particular schemas that correspond to the property graphs that uh, are in use at Uber. And so uh, this slide here actually gives a schema, so it's in the same way as th these other ones, right? Literally, you know, exactly the same kind of schema for algebraic property graphs in the sense that they're being used at Uber and other places. So you know, presumably Uber's notion is a little bit different than anyone 
or they're, you know, they're, property graph is a, a term used in a lot of places, and so you just have to be careful what's meant by it. But um, for the purposes of our work, uh, what's meant by it is this. And so this is a, a schema like we just saw that can capture property graph data. And so uh, in the way we think about property graphs, there's four sorts of things, four kinds of things. Uh, elements, these are going to be nodes and vertices and other graph structure. Values, these are like datums that are actually carried by the graph, concrete values. And then labels and types, which are like metadata, sort of schema related things. You know, it tells you that Alice is a string and three is a numeral, uh, and that trips are associated with pairs of users. So um, the, the nitty gritty details are in the paper, but the, the basic idea is that you know, between these four things, we also have four relationships. Uh, every element has a value. So every element has, you know, you can look it up and be like, get me the, the value associated with, uh, you know, the user Alice and you can, or the user U1 and find out that it's Alice. Um, th those values themselves have types, so Alice is a string. Uh, the elements have these labels, so uh, these give the, the, the types of data. So users are string, users have string data attached and trips have pairs of users attached. Um, and then, uh, Oops, did I, I think I might have shown this backwards. Um, yeah, so ignore yeah, so yeah, where my mouse was going. But the point is there's four functions here that, uh, yeah, associate elements to labels, labels to types, elements to values, values to types, and they have to, to be equal like this. Uh, maybe you should describe it since this is a... Oh, that, that, that I think you described it beautifully. Uh, I could paraphrase. So, you know, in a graph you have elements like vertices and, and properties and edges. Um, and in our formalism, those are always uh, labeled. So typically in property graphs, um, every edge is labeled. Vertices may or may not be labeled. Um, uh, so in algebraic property graphs, every vertex is labeled, but you can have a, a default uh, vertex for uh, label for unlabeled vertices. Uh, but then, yeah, so for example, um, an element would be uh, a user. You've got a, a U1 here as a user, and its label is user. And then that label has a schema associated with it. Um, and that, that schema is a data type. In this case, um, it basically just has a property, which is the name. Um, if you look at something else like um, trip here, which is um, an edge, um, its label is trip. Um, and if you go from that label to its schema, which again is a type, um, that is um, something that connects a user with a user. So it's a Cartesian product of, of user uh, with user. Um, the value of that element is a specific ordered pair. Um, for T1 you've got U1 and U2, for T2 you've got U1 and U3. So trip T1 um, goes from user U1 to user U2. Uh, that's the value and then the type of that value is the same as the schema of the label. Um, that's our basic uh, data integrity constraint. Um, it's uh, the type of the tuple is uh, user times user. So uh, you, cool. can, you can think of kind of a, a, a property graph mantra. Um, the type of the value is the schema of the label. Type of value is schema of label. There you go. Close your eyes and, and repeat that to yourself while taking deep breaths. Now, well, one issue though is that this schema just described is actually too general that you were alluding to, this is an ordered pair, but there's not really anything up here that indicates, you know, these should be ordered pairs. And so in the paper, we talk about the fine details of the values here. And so anyway, just a, a note to the audience that this schema, while sufficient to hold an algebraic property graph, is more general. You know, you could put things in here that, um, you know, or I guess what I'm getting at is there's more constraints on an algebraic property graph than just this. We, we enumerate them in the paper, but yeah, uh, algebraic property graphs are more than just four functions that form a commutative square. Yeah, um, it doesn't even technically need, I mean, this doesn't tell you that it has to even be algebraic, right? There could be a variety of, of things that that, uh, that that have this property. Or, um, but, yeah, I was going to say, um, yeah, not, not product sum. The fact that we're using an equation here kind of means algebraic in the sense of algebraic theories being equational, but like the product sum aspect of this is just not represented whatsoever, nor is the distinction between like types in the sense of strings and like users in the sense of 
you know, Alice, those are kind of, as we said before, there's probably infinitely many strings, but not infinitely many users. So both of those, for both of those reasons, we call this an overly general schema. And what we'll see in a minute is how to get a better schema. Uh, but just so that people can see what that actually looks like as a graph, um, using the same machinery as before, you know, math just says, okay, you have a schema and some data, turn it into a graph. And this is what you get when you do it according to the above schema. Right, you have all your your no your edges here are the you know value of and label of and schema of and type of types of relationships. The type of pair u one and u two is this user. So uh, anyway, this is a natural triple representation of of this type of uh, algebraic property graph. But you know the big reveal, of course, is that um, you can put the fine structure of the product and sums in the algebraic property graph directly into the schema that it's in. So this is something called a product sum schema. It extends the notion of categorical schema that we described earlier by assigning meaning to symbols such as times. And in particular, what you have the meaning for times is projection. And so when you represent algebraic property graphs using product sum schemas, each algebraic property graph schema becomes you know, eight, the schema that your data is on. So, you know, the one we had before, trip and user, now they're part of this graph up here. And, you know, you, you see just a much more concise representation, you know, even to the point where, oh, these pairs, they get broken up. You know, here's the, the first projection, here's the second. And so, anyway, this is an alternative approach to representing algebraic property graphs that's not too general, that uh, everything that conforms to this schema will be an algebraic property graph uh, and vice versa. So um, maybe we should back up for a moment and just say what we mean by products and sum. So I think product is probably clear. Like you see that that user times user. It's a product between the you know the user type and the, uh, the user type. Um, and that's um, uh, instances okay. of that type are a set of, of are, are ordered pairs, right? So what's a sum type? Ah, right. And so you're also noticing here, you know, I didn't fill out the whole table because only two of these are actually mentioned elsewhere, but it, you know, there should be nine entries here in user. Similarly, user plus user, there'd be six entries. It'd be, you know, user, uh, user uh, you do a disjoint union. So it's like left U1, left U2, left U3, and then also right U1, right U2, right U3. So if this were user plus user, you'd have six rows. Uh, two copies of U1, two copies of U2, two copies of U3, but they'd be distinguished. And so that's that's what's meant by, by some. Yeah, that's kind of like an, <clears throat> excuse me, um, an or as opposed to an and, right? So in a, an order pair, you have um, you know, a user and another user. In a, um, um, a variant, you'd have either a user on the left or a user on the right. If there are two different types, maybe you'd have like, um, say user and organization. So a thing can be either a user or an organization. It can't be both. Correct. Yep. And so that's something we, we talk about in the paper, but don't have written in these uh, slides here. So these are technically just product uh, schemas. Don't, no sums written, written here. But uh, yeah, as before, they turn into just a very natural type of uh, graph representation. Right, here's T1, it has an edge called trip, it goes into this ordered pair. You know, you have to remember the fact like, oh, this is an ordered pair, for example, because, and this finally gets to the question on chat, when you go to encode this as RDF, um, you have to remember, you have to pick resources, right? You know, we have some literals, we have some blank nodes, and uh, so, yeah, you know, you remember there, like, uh, when you when you finally do this, that you know, this, this blank node projects to this literal or this other blank node. So, um, yeah, Josh, you, you know more about this part than I do. But, the yeah, the basic idea is that uh, when you have all this structure, you know, all the product tables and the sum tables, all you have to do is tag each thing with an RDF resource, and then you can directly serialize an algebraic property graph uh, looking like this up above. And that completes the story. So. Yeah, um, and back again. <laughs> right, and back. So, again. in theory, you could go from RDF back to uh, back to a property graph. Right. Uh, that you do need the schema for that, of course. So, you know, just as before, you know, the fact that this you know this thing has to be hanging around to help guide you. But uh, 
Yep, that's uh, yeah. So the schema is always is always part of the graph. Um, uh, well, thanks, Ryan. Any any other kind of uh, high level um, comments about category theory or uh, data integration that you want to mention before we uh, close? Well, boy. Uh, so I, I heard that as Not a, a quest to the audience, actually, and so. Yeah, I think there's just the conclusion is that, you know, graphs are gaining in prominence now because they're so useful. And, you know, we already know from mathematics that if you just go one step higher to a graph, you get something that's useful enough to handle, like, all of math. And so the key takeaway, I think, for the audience is that if you just generalize slightly from, say, knowledge graphs to knowledge categories or, you know, you, you, you move, you shift just a little bit, you can actually get a lot more power that the, the shift, you know, from graphs to categories, you know, even though you're just adding little sets of equations is actually, you know, that gives you a, a, a formalism now that's Turing complete. It gives you all this extra stuff. So I think the takeaway is, you know, if you like graphs, you may very well like categories even better. Um, and hopefully this has been a bit of a, a teaser and gets people interested, but all this stuff is in fact working uh, in software. And so you can go download implementations of this and, and play with it and, uh, and all of that. So I guess, I guess that's a takeaway. Uh, graphs are good, but categories are better and they're just now uh, getting started. So we hope you know, people can, we can all interact and form a community and, and all of that. So, yeah. That, that's thank awesome. you, Josh, for, for having me. Yeah. Thanks very much. Okay. So, um, again, this was episode three of The Graph Show. For past episodes, uh, check out datageeks.tv.